This is lesson 19. We started last week sort of an introduction into Malachi chapter 10 through chapter 2, verse 10 through 17, and we're going to go a little further in this today. Many of the things that we have talked about in the past, uh, we're going to have to remember as we begin to dig into what, what God's Word says to us about this passage, <coughs> because uh, there's a lot of things that are interconnected in, in this passage. So first of all, you remember a long time ago, and we've talked about this several times, <coughs> We talked about the difference between a root sin and a fruit sin. And until we we can confess a fruit sin all we want, and we might even be able to remove one fruit sin from our life, but as long as the root of that sin still is active in our heart, it's going to continue to produce fruit. And the fruit might look differently, but it comes from the same root. So, I didn't talk about this specifically last week. But when we think that divorce is a root sin or a fruit sin, well, if you remember last week, uh, God allowed, allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart. The hardness of heart is the root sin because when you have a hard heart, it produces the fruit of divorce. You can say, well, I'm sorry I got a divorce. You can even say, I repent of getting a divorce. But as long as you continue to have that hard heart, it may produce other visible results in your life but the true repentance and change of heart occurs here. And until this change, the, it's going to still produce fruit in your life. Okay? That's, we're going to get into that more next week. But <clears throat> Next question. So if we look at Matthew chapter 1, I talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to come back and touch on it again. Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy of Christ. And they start with Abraham, and they trace the genealogy then down to, to Jacob, I'm sorry, to Joseph, the, the husband of Mary. And then in another place, it traces the generations of, it traces back Mary's genealogy. But in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, it speaks about a man named Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N. He was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Now, Rahab, we remember is was the harlot, the prostitute that lived in uh, Jericho. But she was converted by the power of God. And after she was converted, she, she married this man named Salma. Now, this tells us something about what kind of man Salmon was. First of all, 
we know he was a man of faith because he was included in the genealogy of David the king, but also of Christ. The Bible tells us that when we, we come to Christ and we are born again, We become new creatures. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now that's a very beautiful concept to think about. But who was Rahab? She's a prostitute. She was. She was an idolater. Now, if, if your son or grandson uh, brought this kind of woman home to meet you guys and say, this is my future wife. Now it's not a th now this is not a theory anymore. This is reality. Is this girl worthy to be married to your son or grandson? And what kind of a man would be willing to accept this woman as his wife? Wouldn't it have to be? The kind of man that knows the reality that once we, we are born again and we become new creatures, the old things pass away. And she is not known for what she was. She is known for what she is now, which is a hero of faith. And she's mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith in the, in the book of Hebrews. You see, it's one thing to talk about it in theory. Oh, yes, we're forgiven. All our sins are taken away. We're born again. We're part of God's adopted children. It's a new family. We're new creatures. The old things have passed away. Until that kind of person is going to be married to one of your children or grandchildren. See, then it's not theory anymore. It's practice. But what kind of man was Solomon? Well, we don't know. But we know that he was a man who believed this because he married her. And who was their child? The child was Boaz. What kind of man was Boaz? Well, he was also a godly man. And who did Boaz marry? Moabite. A Moabite Ruth. She was a Moabite. But she too was born into the kingdom of God and she became a new creature. And Boaz took her to be his wife and they produced a child named Obed. Obed produced a child named Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. And, of course, Christ was a descendant of David and a, and a descendant of all these people. Now, it's unusual when we read the genealogy of, of Christ or of anybody else, it's unusual for, for the woman's name to be mentioned. Normally speaking, it's just the husband's name. But here we have two women who were mentioned by name very specifically and women who were uh, 
Gentiles, where they were idol worshipers in their youth, but then they were they all came to God. So, <clears throat> can we say blanket statement? It's always a sin for a child of God to marry a a heathen or a idol worshiper in today's language, a lost person. Well, yes and no. If they were a an idol worshiper who has come to God and been transformed by the power of God, and they're born again, they become new creatures. Yes, of course, it's not a problem because the Bible tells us they're new creatures. Old things have passed away. As I say, that's hard when it's somebody, you know, if they're, in theory, it's easy, but if it's somebody that, that you know and love, it becomes more difficult. All right, so let's go back now to Malachi chapter 2. Oh, one last question. The, the question is, can divorce be forgiven? And the answer is yes, but. And so we're going to be looking at part of that yes, but answer today. Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 10. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers, or everyone who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts on behalf of that man. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, although she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. So that's just another way of saying they have a hard heart. No one who has had a remnant of the Holy Spirit has done these things. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or where is the God of justice? Now, if you paid much attention to the news the past couple of weeks, you've seen how this last part of that verse we just read is becoming true in America. Those who do evil are praised, and those who are trying to do good are considered evil. <laughs> These are all characteristics of what happens in a society when uh, there is the loss of the fear of the Lord. Okay, so Malachi 2.10. God asks the question, do we not all have one father? And this refers back to chapter 1, verse 6, where he says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my father? honor. Is, the Bible tells us, as just a matter of fact, truth, 
that God is the father of the Hebrew nation. But we also know that God is the father of all the redeemed. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, what words did he use to teach them to pray? Our father who art in heaven. We call that prayer the Our Father prayer. <clears throat> we, we, it's very clear that God is our Father. But let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 tracks along with what we're looking at in Malachi. Okay, so here he starts out with the word if. If you address his father. If you, you pray our father who art in heaven, or if you pray to God as your father. If you do that. If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, then it's imperative voice. We are to conduct ourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth or conduct yourselves in fear during the, your time of sojourning here on, on this earth. So these things all fit together and go together. If you're going to call him father, then you have to acknowledge and, and live in the holy fear of God. Now, it's interesting that we are called, that God is called our Father. When we're speaking about the Hebrew nation, we speak about Father Abraham, right? Why don't we speak about Father Adam? We all came from Adam. Well, were all of Abraham's children included in the, the covenant God made with the Hebrew children? No. Ishmael wasn't. The children born, the sons born to Abraham after Sarah died are not included. Okay, so who was Abraham's child? Yet Abraham had a son, Isaac. And Isaac had two boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. Are Esau's children considered part of the the children of God? No. Ishmael's not. There, I think there was four or five boys that were born after Sarah died. They're not. When we speak about Father Abraham, we're, we're talking about Abraham was a man of faith. Isaac was a man of faith. Jacob was faith. So that what that tells us, that from the very beginning, without faith, it was impossible to be a part of the spiritual Abraham, of spiritual children of Abraham. Now, from, from pretty early on, they began to think if, if you're genetically, if you were related to Abraham, that you were a, a child of Abraham. But as, as we've seen, that's, that, that was a mistake. <laughs> Those who can truthfully call God our Father are those who are in a covenant relationship with God, a relationship by faith. They're adopted children of God. And thus, the Bible tells us that if, if someone who is in a covenant faith relationship with God marries a heathen back in their time, in our time we would say a lost person, and they are desecrating, it's 
what God tells us here in Malachi chapter 2. You are desecrating God's covenant. Now let's think about that for a second. Desecrating God's covenant. Does that sound serious? Yeah, it does. <clears throat> statistics, not our church, thankfully, but statistics tell us that in America, about 50% of church members are divorced. That's how sort of serious. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to see exactly what God thinks about this and what is God's answer. Okay, so God says we all have one father, speaking about those who are covenant relationship with God. <clears throat> He then he asks, why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Now, it's a little... We have to learn to see how God uses the language. If we're in a covenant relationship with God, we call all men who are in covenant relationship with God our brother. And we call all women who are in covenant relationship with God our sister because we are adopted children of God. We have the same heavenly father. In faith, that's who we are. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. The New Testament uses that example. <clears throat> okay, so just speaking of not in the church, just in the world, a husband is supposed to have a very special relationship with his wife, not just in the in the sexual connotation, but he is to provide for her, he is to love her, to care for her, to be kind to her, and she has a very different relationship, or supposed to, with her husband than any other man in society. And the requirements, uh, biblically speaking, of, of how a husband and wife live together is very high, whether they're a child of God or not. But what he's saying he, in, here in Malachi is that if you are married to a woman who is also an adopted child of God, that God holds that man to a higher standard. Okay, so I'm, I'll try to give it to you in a, in maybe a way that makes it a little easier to understand. So to the dads, if your wife's husband was not showing, I mean, I'm sorry, if your daughter's husband did not treat her right, and show, show her the kind of respect and love that you think she deserves, how would you feel towards that guy? Would you not hold him to a higher standard than you would just somebody married to some other woman that you don't know? See what I'm saying? That's what God is doing. He's saying to, to us men, yes, yeah, she's your wife, but she's my child. 
And if you deal treacherously with her, then God calls that an, an abomination against the nation of Israel. He also calls that profaning the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves. Now, in the particular instance that we're reading about here in Malachi, it's the men who were dealing treacherously with their wife, who was a wife of the covenant, and then they're going out and they're marrying an idolatrous girl, a heathen girl. But it is still dealing treacherously and it still profanes the sanctuary. And thus God says they need to be cut off. And the person who offers an, uh, an offering for them, that's in verse 12, who presents an offering for them should be cut off also. Okay, so why is this so? Well, in Exodus chapter 19, let's go back and just look at some of these, these verses. I think most of them will be familiar to all of us. <clears throat> we talked about this from the perspective of the New Testament a couple of weeks ago. Exodus 19, starting in verse 4. This is God uh, speaking to the people while they're on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> God says to them, Now, then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now, the words there that it says own possession, sometimes also translated special treasure, it speaks about the special relationship that people who are in covenant with God have with their Heavenly Father. <clears throat> you will be my own possession. You will be my special treasure. Verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So it was God's plan that the nation of Israel would be his special treasure, his own possession, and that they would be to him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, of course, we understand later when they sin with the golden calf that God called out a priest to it. But this was God's plan. And then Exodus 24 and of course, we know that this was also, this idea is also repeated in the New Testament. We are peculiar people. <clears throat> okay, so Exodus 24, 8. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So as they entered into the, the covenant with God, Moses sprinkled upon the people the blood, and it's called the blood of the covenant. Now, thinking about us living in the New Testament, was it the blood of a bull that was sprinkled upon us? which brought us into the covenant with God? No, it was the blood of Christ. Thus, we are held to a much higher standard. Okay, going back to Malachi chapter 2, verse 11. He's accusing them, and rightfully accusing them, of dealing treacherously with the wife of their youth. Judah has dealt treacherously. The word treacherously means deceitfully, 
unfaithfully and transgressing against God's law. This is why in verse 16, God said, I hate divorce because divorce is dealing treacherously, deceitfully, unfaithfully with your marriage partner. Now, we've got the beautiful young lady and the groom and they've come to be united in the, the marriage ceremony. Now, of course, we understand that there are some legal requirements by the government where you live that must be met before there can be a marriage between a man and a woman. But when we make our vows, we are making our vows before God. And the man is promising God and the woman that he's going to live in a certain way. The woman is promising God and the man that they're going to live in a certain way. The vows are made before God. You're promising God. Now, maybe you didn't realize that when you got married. Maybe we want to forget that sometimes, but in reality, we are promising God. And so when we deal unfaithfully, treacherously, deceitfully between the husband and wife, we don't like to think about it, but we're also doing that against God. And that's what God is trying to tell us about here. If we're not true to our marital vows, then we are de dealing dece deceitfully and treacherously with our spouse. We're dealing treacherously and deceitfully with God. Is that the kind of people we want to be our church leaders? It doesn't seem super wise to me. Now this next part is a little more difficult to understand, but we're going to do our best. Not only has Judah dealt treacherously and been an abomination committed against Israel in Jerusalem because Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord. Because of divorce, they have profaned sanctuary. Now, if someone were to go into our sanctuary, today they'd be hot, but let's say they break in at night and they write all kinds of terrible graffiti across the walls. We would understand that as profaning the sanctuary of God, right? In Hebrew, it's a little more difficult because I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little easier if you if we read and understand Hebrew, because there's one word that describes the place, and it's another word that describes the people. That there is a physical place, a building that was called the sanctuary of God, but there. The people of God, 
are also called his sanctuary. And both of these two ideas are included in the, the covering, the what God is talking about when he says they have uh, profaned the sanctuary. So this first word talks about a physical place. It's a place that has been consecrated by God, but it can also refer to the offering, the animal that was sacrificed. In the New Testament, that's the idea of presenting your body as a living sacrifice. That's where it comes from. This, the name of this place is called sanctified in English, but in Hebrew, the name comes from the word holy. So we could say the holy place, the holy offering. And then the second word, which is a different word in Hebrew, but it also comes from the meaning of the word holy. So we have a holy people that that God's nation was to be holy. And thus the, the desecration. So let's look at a couple of places. Exodus 25, 8. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but just enough that you get the idea of what God is trying to explain to us. Exodus 25, 8. Exodus Exodus 25, 8. This is God speaking about the construction of the sanctuary. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Now, we know, of course, that God does not need a building to live in. But to, to teach us something, he said, let them construct a sanctuary for me. It's a holy place. And then in Numbers 10, 21, Again, we see this same meaning. As then the Kohathites set out carrying the holy objects and the tabernacle. And the word tabernacle there is the word sanctuary in Hebrew. Carrying the holy objects and the tabernacle was set up before their arrival. They're speaking about a, a physical place and a physical object. Objects that have been dedicated to use in the temple. Now the second meaning, let's look at Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And of, of all the places in the Bible, I think. <clears throat> I mean, this one is, is about as clear as all. God says, now then, if you will obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be my own possession. In Hebrew, in Hebrew it would be my peculiar treasure and the holy nation. I'm sorry. Keep, you should be my possession, my peculiar treasure among all the peoples for all the earth is mine and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation or in Leviticus 11:45, God says you shall therefore be holy for I am holy He's again speaking about the holy nation the holy people that God wants us to be in Psalm 114 and verse 2 And this also is, is fairly clear, although it might be hard to understand. So verse 1, when Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange languages, Judah 
became his, God's, sanctuary. And Israel, his dominion. Judah, the nation of Judah, the Hebrew nation, the people, the people as the sanctuary. So you have a sanctuary of people who meet in a sanctuary to offer their offerings. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 6 says that we're God's holy people. He dwells with us. Deuteronomy 14, 2 says we're a holy people and a peculiar people. 2 Corinthians 6. This same concept is carried forward in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Chapter 6. I'm in 1 Corinthians. Got to get to 2. Second Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What harmony has Christ with Belial, or some people want to use the word saints in there. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Okay. So the idea that God is, is trying to help us to understand I'm going to draw it in the shape of a building. So let's think about a sanctuary, but it's not made with bricks and mortar and boards and whatever. The sanctuary is made of people. And so we take this particular person, says, I want to be part of the temple of God, and I want to be the, a part <coughs> through marriage. I want to join myself with an idol. Well, that desecrates the temple. Second, First Corinthians three sixteen. <laughs> Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. And then the same 1 Corinthians, now we're going to go to chapter 6, starting with verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away, take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know 
that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her. For he, God, says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You have been brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. That when a man joins with a, this idol worshiper, the Bible says there two become one. One flesh is how we used to describe what happens to a the single man and the single woman through the marriage relationship. The two become one flesh. Uh, here it says this happens through uh, the, through sexual intercourse and they become one flesh when they when the man does this with an idolatry 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 idolatrous He's becoming one flesh with her and so profaning the temple of God. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, continues with this idea. So then, that means once we are in Christ, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. For you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. And thus, that's our picture of a sanctuary not made with physical means, but of people. And we are being built together as the dwelling of God. And then 1 Peter chapter 2. Verses 4 and 5. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, speaking about us, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are the living stones if we've been born into the kingdom of God, and we are being built into this living sanctuary. And then the beauty of this, then, of course, is in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, we'll start with verse 1. It's speaking about in the future, after everything on earth has been finished. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, 
There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So this is God speaking about the kind of relationship that he desires to have with us and will have with us in heaven. We're the living stones. We make up this living sanctuary and God dwells with us. Really, the, we would say among us. Now, what we're reading about here is how it will be in perfection in heaven. But that is the picture of what God wants to have among us here on this earth. And we call it a church. Church should be a body of believers who dwell together in harmony with each other <coughs> and with God. And when the world sees this, then the world is convicted and they too want to have a part of this. But when, when the body is fighting with each other, they're destroying the unity and the holiness of what is supposed to be God's sanctuary, not a building, but the people. That is called dealing treacherously with each other. And divorce among believers is one of those things that can happen. It's a fruit, remember. It's a fruit. It's not the root. Now then, how do you fix this? When we find ourselves in this position, how do we fix it? Well, it turns out, Ezra chapter 9, this has happened several times in history. Happened in Malachi's day. It's happening in our day. But it also happened in Ezra's day. If you remember, the people have been in captivity for a long time because of the, the Jeremiah's day. They practiced idolatry. To such an extent, God destroyed them. Now, he's bringing them back. And they're rebuilding the temple. God's given them this blessing. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and here is where God is really speaking to, to us, you and I. Now, when these things have been completed... The princes approached me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands according to their abominations. Those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves <clears throat> and for their sons so that the holy race has intermingled with the peoples of the land. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. Now the princes and the rulers, I'm sorry, and the rulers, yes, were supposed to be spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. So their spiritual leaders have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. When I heard about this matter, matter Ezra is speaking, I tore my garment and my robe and pulled some of the hair from my head and my beard and I sat down of Paul. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles gathered to me, and I sat appalled 
until the evening offering. Everyone who trembled, in, I think in King James it says, everyone who feared the word of the Lord. But it is one of our fear of God words. The priests thought it was okay. The rulers thought it was okay. The common people thought it was okay. Those who feared God, who trembled at his word, or we can use the words, feared the word of the Lord, they sat appalled. If there's nobody that fears the word of the Lord and nobody who fears God in the congregation, there's nobody to sit appalled. And if there's nobody to sit appalled, there's no way to fix the problem. God is trying to raise up among us those who fear God and who fear the word of the Lord. Because without these, there's no one to sit appalled. Without the people who sit appalled, there's no one to make intersection session, and there's no way for the people to come back. Okay, so we think about America. Or we can think about Russia. It's the ones who fear the word of the Lord, the ones who fear God, who are going to sit appalled and eventually make intercession. And if we have none of these people, then there's no hope. Now, <clears throat> Ezra 10.3 <clears throat> After Ezra has and those who feared the word of the Lord have sat appalled after they've done their praying that God begins to move among the, the these princes and rulers verse 10 we're going to come back to this, but just to help you understand how important this is. While Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly. There was just a very few who feared God and who trembled at God's word. Very few. But they were praying. And while they were praying, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel. For the people wept bitterly because of these very few who fear God and sat appalled and began to pray. The Holy Spirit began to work in among the, the multitudes. And they said, then this man comes. He's one of the sons of Elam. And he says, we have been unfaithful to our God. We have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. So now let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and according to the counsel of those who tremble at the command of our God and let it be done according to the law. So these who have sinned, they come and they say, we recognize we've done this terrible sin. We need to get back right with God. We don't know how to do it. So we're going to appeal to the counsel of God. And we're going to appeal to the counsel of those who tremble at the command of God. And then if you go on and read the rest of this chapter, they spend about three months. Searching out, investigating, making a list of those who have sinned, making a list of the specific things they've done. Verse 13, in the second part, it says, nor can the task be done in one or two days. 
they understand we have transgressed greatly in this matter. We don't have a fruit sin. We have a root sin. And so it's going to take some time to investigate it out and to do it right. And it actually took about three months. So you have to have these people. It's mentioned twice. There's another. There's a third time where these exact same words are used. Isaiah 66. Now, it doesn't necessarily. It may not necessarily be the exact same verses words in your translation of the Bible, but in Hebrew it's the same. First, verse we're going to look at is verse 2, but we're going to start in verse 1, Isaiah 66, 1. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you may build for me, and where is a place that I may rest? He's not speaking about an earthly building. For my hand made all of these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. This is God. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. One who trembles at my word. Now in verse 5, it's the same word. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you for my name's sake, have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they will be put to shame. Now, if you're going to become a person who fears the word of the Lord, who trembles at God's word, you have to understand that if you become this, many people are going to hate you. Now, not lost people, I'm talking about people in the church. They're going to hate you because your presence is to them conviction of sin. But in Ezra's day, and I am hopeful that in our day, once the people come to their senses, they're going to uh, come back. And seek out those who tremble at God's word. First Chronicles 12. We've looked at this a long time ago. I want to refresh our memory. Because it's talking about the same kind of people. First Chronicles chapter 12. Verse 32. In this particular time in Israel, there was <clears throat> there was a few of these of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Their chiefs were two hundred, and all the kinsmen were at their command. So it's a small group of people. They're men who understood the times and who had knowledge of what Israel should do. They were men who trembled at God's word. So that's describing the kind of man Ezra was. So let's go back to Ezra now in verse chapter 9. Men who understood the times and had knowledge of what they should do. They come to Ezra. From 5 to verse 15, they're going through this process. 
They're men who trembled at God's word. They had knowledge of what needed to be done, how to deal with a root sin. You can't deal with root sin in one moment. And these men knew what to do. They interceded on behalf of the people. And in verse 15, they said, O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. For we have we have been left an escape from that as it is to this day. Lord, we are before you in our guilt, for no one can stand before you because of this. Now, while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself, that's when they come and they they say, we want you to intercede. And he does. And in the end, they, they get back right with God. They repented that they had this hard heart. And God changed their hearts and brought them back to themselves. But there have to be a people who tremble at God's word. People who fear God. Without this, there's no way for the people to give back. That's what he said in Malachi. And we've looked at this several times. Malachi chapter 1. He said, where is my, it's very specific kind of, the unholy fear of God. And then in chapter 2. He said, when there was these kind of people, true instruction was in his mouth and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and he turned many back from iniquity. He turned many back from iniquity. When the spiritual leaders are in that right relationship with God. When they tremble at God's word, when they fear God, then people turn back to God. But when there's not, and when we lose this fear of God, then of course we see like what happened in Malachi's day. They profane and desecrate God's sanctuary. Okay. I tried to make it as short as possible. We'll continue next week to uh, to go through this.